Hi everybody and welcome to the latest CTO Craft Bites. Today we are going to have a little talk from Katerina here. Um, if this is your first time at a CTO Craft Bites event, let me tell you a little bit more about the group. CTO Craft is a mentoring and coaching community for technology leader, leaders all over the world, focusing on supporting technologists in their leadership growth. Community members are currently over 8,000 and CTO Craft provides them with one-to-one -one coaching, mentoring groups, a curated Slack community and events just like this one. If you're not a member of the CTO Craft community and are interested in becoming one, uh, or you just like to get updates about these events on emails, I am going to post a few links for you now into the chat. Three, two, one. There you go. Um, huge thanks today to the headline partner AWS for helping to make these event bites events possible. And a special thank you to Adiva who are sponsoring this particular event today. So Adiva enables work without boundaries by connecting high scale companies with tech talent across the world. Using a community driven approach to scaling engineering teams fast, Adiva helps fast growing companies get access to exceptional tech talent. With over 98% success rate, Adiva is dedicated to changing the way work works and shaping the future of work. I'm Emma Hopkinson Spark. I'm Chief of Staff at a consultancy called 101 Ways, and you've probably seen me on a few of these before if you joined them too. You can also find me on the Slack group as well and say hello, connect on LinkedIn, anything like that, or share lots of links later too. And I am joined today by Katerina, who is the CEO of Adiva. Uh, Katerina, do you want to just say hello, introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you, Emma. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm the CEO of Adiva. I've been with the company for over set, almost eight years actually now. Um, we've been remote since 2016, uh, so long before it was popular. Now we've had uh, most of the problems that a lot of companies were facing with these past years and uh, you know, learned through, uh, through the pains uh, that we were facing about how to better uh, work with remote teams, how to scale. Um, how to create this uh, community of global members to be able to support our, our growth. Uh, so these are the things that I'd like to uh, discuss today uh, to potentially share my experience with help any of you who are struggling with uh, remote hiring. Excellent, thank you. Just say so your sound is a little bit muffled. The mic is a little bit muffled, so I might just want to move it closer to or something as we as we get into the conversation. We'll see how we go. I'll keep an eye on it. Um, for everyone else, I can see people have already started piling in with the hellos and where you are from. I think it's especially relevant as we're talking about working remote. I did spot somebody say they're just down the road from me. So um, Jason over in Bridgewater, I'm in Western Supermare, so just up the road, and loads of other places at Los Angeles as well. He's making that up. He's not really in LA, just showing off because it's all sunny and warm, I'm sure. Um, do say hello, keep chatting, share your LinkedIn, anything you like over in the chat. You'll also see along the bottom a little button down there that says ask a question. So this is going to be a very conversational, informal chat. I This is a topic that's particularly close to my heart, so I'm sure I will be able to dig in to all the stuff that we're interested in. But if there is anything you particularly want to ask Katerina or make a comment on, pop it into that ask a question bit and I will make sure that we weave that into the conversation as we go. Okay, so let's get started. So this is all about then scanning engineering teams remotely. And um, of course, everyone has been working remotely in one form or another. It's been around for a really long time, but never more relevant than the last couple of years, obviously. So yeah, just talk me through that, that change, what it's meant for you and what you've seen then, what's the big changes been lately? Uh, so for me, the thing that I'm really fascinated about is how people, when they need to uh, adapt and they, they need to go through this change and uh, there's no other way to do it, uh, everyone just adapts and everyone um, creates new processes at work uh, and uh, they are able to continue the, the business, you know, as, as uh, with almost no disruptions, uh, basically, because what happened in the last years, uh, we've had uh, just, I don't know, not even weeks uh, to adapt to this uh, new way of work and everyone had to um, convert the, their teams to remote working, to adapt to new tools, technologies. And uh, when uh, they were forced to do it, it was uh, easy. But when we have this choice, then it becomes hard because we want everything to be perfect. We want, uh, we're used to ways of managing people that are uh, not really adaptable to the, to the remote environment. It's, uh, 
you know, you, you, you can't spend how much time people spend in front of uh, their computers when they're working remotely. Uh, so I think this is uh, one thing that we learned in the past years is that uh, if we wait uh, for some disruption to happen um, in the industry and then um, adapt to it, we will need to adapt. Uh, but uh, the better choice that we can make here is to try to understand what are the advantages that we can have uh, and, and you know make this change uh, before it's it's uh, mandatory on us. Um, in terms of what had to change for us, it was uh, way back, uh, and um, we were all working remotely, and it was kind of an experiment uh, approach that we wanted to uh, give to the people. Uh, and we introduced it first as a remote Friday. So uh, in the first uh, weeks, nobody wanted uh, to work remotely. Everyone was uh, kind of this, we had this uh, close, uh, the, the company culture was kind of um, small team. Uh, everybody is close to one another. We're working from the same office. We're uh, sharing some interesting moments there. And so people enjoyed it. Uh, so nobody wanted to, to work remotely. And we, we didn't have time to motivate them to start doing it. So, that was the, the first um, challenge uh, that we faced. Uh, and then uh, once people started doing it, how to actually be uh, productive because uh, it was a completely different environment for everyone. And we had quite some time to adapt. So I think it was uh, one year of a process when, you know, starting from a remote Friday until uh, the next year we introduced Office Tuesday because we wanted to have some uh, in-person time. Um, and during this time, people adapted to this new environment sure that all the processes were um, okay uh, for the remote work, so transitioning the meetings online, and making sure we're more asynchronous in the work so that people can uh, collaborate, but uh, not having to depend on everyone being uh, in the same place at the same time. Um, and uh, once we did that, the opportunities were um, in increased significantly for, for hiring people, because uh, now you're not restricted to this um geolocation anymore uh, you can go abroad you can uh, introduce new people uh, to the team from anywhere in the world uh, and uh, what again that means uh, for performance and for the business uh, everything needs to be adapted to to make sure that uh, things work work together yeah, your mic is still dropping in and out a little bit, Katarina. I don't know if it's it's like it's a little bit muffled. Oh. It's like it's not quite connecting properly. Or if it's not the mic on your headphones, or if it's not if it's if you think it's on the computer, it's on the headphones. Something is not quite right on your mic. So if you can have a little t try and just check the settings, that would be good. But we did um, hear just while you're while you're doing that. I just say. Um, I did hear, got the gist of, of what you were saying. There were just a few points it was catching out. And there's a couple of things I'd like to um, to drill into a little bit more on that. So um, Can you just, sorry for interrupting, is it better now? It is, yes. Okay. And I think audience it was as the well. Wrong, I can see a few it people was uh, selected, I guess. I think it was the wrong mic. Yes. Okay, that is better. Yes, we'll go with that. Great. Awesome. Sorry for that. It's okay, we'll get there. Um, so, uh, yeah, you said like how quickly people had to adapt a couple of years ago. But then I think about it and I'm like, we're now at the beginning of 2023. So that was like three years ago when everybody started adapting and started changing. Are companies, are people still adapting and still trying to figure it out then? Or do you think everybody is kind of settled into the way that they want to work now? What are you seeing? Uh, I think the basics are there so everyone is able to work remotely now everyone is able to have someone out of the office once in a while and um, all of the meetings most of the meetings are done virtually people can work from some people can work from the office some of them can be remote that's uh, fine with most of the companies that i know uh, but going one step for, uh, forward and making sure that uh, the team is actually getting all of the advantages of working remotely, I think we're not there yet. And I think that's the thing that companies need to now work on and adapt on. Uh, I mentioned async work. Um, we are uh, trying, we're not completely async at Adiva, but we're trying to implement um, the processes to, to make sure that people can work independently from one another. Having this documentation in place, uh, having this meeting structure in place that doesn't waste people's time, but uh, it's very, very productive and uh, you have other means of communication when you're not on a meeting so that 
uh, you don't overwhelm people with all of this. There, there was this uh, term coined at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, which was called Zoom, uh, Zoom fatigue. fatigue. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's exhausting. I mean, uh, in-person meetings are exhausting too, but you're at least, uh, you know, seeing other people, maybe you're in movement or something, but staying in front of a computer and talking all the time, uh, it's exhausting. And I think uh, we need to focus on creating this, this process of working with people across the world that doesn't require them to uh, meet all the time and talk all the time. So um, properly documenting everything, uh, making communicating with people on uh, Jira, for example, or whatever you use for managing the project or for managing other uh, tasks which are not engineering, uh, instead of being completely in sync on Slack or on Zoom or uh, on other tools like that, I think that's uh, the main thing that uh, from now on uh, we need to focus on because this remote thing is not going away anytime soon. Um, and so the, the more we invest into making it um, work for us, I think it, it would be uh, better for, for the companies. Okay. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person who, who hears what you just described then and gets a little bit nervous as well of the, I guess, the pendulum swinging too far the other way in that, you know, I... There are plenty of people that love being in an office full of people and and would hate the idea of sitting on their own, not talking to people all day. I'm not one of them. I'm perfectly happy in the shed at the bottom of my garden, but whatever. Me and the dog are fine. Um, but also just as simple as like you say, if you really want to push that kind of asynchronous collaboration and communication, then you're relying much more on documentation, on messaging systems and and yeah, offline things and documentation particularly is the thing. Um, agile ways of working and that kind of movement we've been working for a lot of years now trying to push the idea that conversation is more important than comprehensive documentation but if you're going to push people down an async route of to, in terms of collaborating are you just going to up the documentation heavyweight and uh, again and and go swing it the other way what do you think to that I think we need to find the perfect balance uh, because it's not about uh, avoiding one-on-one -on -one communication or team communication um, on a video, for example, or in person. Uh, it's about making sure it, it it's done when it matters. Uh, because uh, what happens now is when we don't want to, when we don't we don't know how to solve something, we just jump on a call and uh, discuss it with a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people on that call are not even relevant for the discussion, but they feel pressured to join because uh, if not, then I need to show up uh, for people to know that uh, I work. Um, and in, in the remote world, that it's not productive. Uh, we, we want to focus on the results. We want to focus on what people deliver instead of uh, just making sure they are there nine to five. Um, and the, that mindset switch, that culture switch uh, is not there yet. So everyone thinks that they need to show up for, the, for a meeting when they're invited, even though they, they can't bring any value. So people are afraid to vocalize that. And uh, we just end up with all these meetings where uh, there are a lot of attendees, but um, only a handful of people are actually contributing. Uh, and for me personally, I, I don't like I don't enjoy meetings uh, very much, uh, and uh, this is a big problem uh, for myself. That's why I've uh, started focusing a lot in this area. Uh, but then uh, recently, I realized that I do enjoy meetings when they are productive, and then and when uh, I I know why uh, I'm attending. You know, uh, so uh, the the balance that uh, that I think we need to come up with is um, to have it, it doesn't have to be this strict document documentation and uh, focus all of our energy on documenting everything and making sure it works offline. Uh, it's just uh, to have a process where we can communicate uh, asynchronously as a first step. Uh, so instead of just uh, asking a question on Slack and waiting for a person to answer and then continuing with our work, maybe we can um, make sure all of our communication is done uh, on Jira, as I mentioned earlier, as an example, so that uh, everything follows the thread here. Uh, whoever uh, is interested can just read through it and understand what's going on without having to bring a lot of people in a meeting. Um, changing that, the mindset and the way of work uh, in that direction where we utilize uh, our tools more uh, and uh, making sure that whatever time we spend uh, on working is actually a productive time instead of dragging each other to uh, to meetings uh, all the time. And I think the hybrid work is, is something that can work for most of the companies because uh, people, 
as you said, a lot of them want the social uh, connection uh, and they enjoy going to the office. Um, the thing there is I think uh, we should focus on being remote first because when we are remote first, we are inclusive. We can uh, include everyone uh, in the conversation and not, uh, you know, not have uh, this communication in silo with the people who are uh, in the office and then the other ones uh, are left out. Uh, we tend to have, even though we are remote, uh, we tend to have uh, quarterly meetings with the team uh, in person. So everyone just uh, flies in. But uh, when someone is not able to do that, we've uh, adapted even those meetings which are uh, strategic and uh, very important for the company to, to work remotely. So now um, we, we share everything on screen. People can join from different countries. We have uh, the team which is in the same place. That's okay. Uh, we are discussing from the same place, but we brought this equipment that enables us uh, to have other people join from different locations. So I think these are kind of the uh, the hybrid scenarios that we need to think of uh, to balance about what works works for us as a company, because not all of the things will work for everyone. There are companies that are more comfortable with working in the office and having just a few days off, a day, a days remote which is completely fine. You just need to be adapted to it and uh, make sure that those days are actually productive. It's not like people are taking day, the day off. Mm. I just get your thoughts quickly on, because um, I, I see companies, we see clients, I said, we know organizations where they have they went completely remote because they had to. They're in that, that, that no man's land of, okay, well, what do we do now? Do we bring people back? Do we not? And they're still figuring that out in a lot of places. But what I see is companies that are saying, OK, we want to cater for both people that want to work remote and people that want to be in the office. So everyone in the office two days a week and three days a week at home. Now, to me, that doesn't feel quite so balanced as it might appear <laughs> on the surface. I'm just wondering your thoughts as well on that. Is that is that the compromise of sometime in the office, sometimes away or yeah, how does that work for you? I don't think so, because there are people who are more productive in the office, and if they want to go five days in the office, they should be able to. I mean, if you're working in a hybrid manner, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then for the people who are more comfortable working from home, it shouldn't be a requirement to go to the office because they can do much more if, if they work from home or from anywhere else, for that matter. Um, so I think that the compromise, that there shouldn't be a compromise. If you're giving people a choice, uh, it's it's better for the business uh, to make the, the choice the right one. You know, if uh, someone performs better remotely and you're forced to have to go to the office, uh, then you, you don't do a favor. And it's the same for people who have preferred the office. So if you're being flexible, uh, it's best to give full flexibility and then for everyone to choose whether they want to go to the office or work from home. It kind of strikes me as the as the worst of both worlds rather than the best. Yes, exactly. Of worlds. It's bad for everyone rather than <laughs> please everyone. It's just how to annoy everybody. Um, <laughs> We do have a question from the audience, actually, and I think it's one that you'll be able to answer quite quite well and, and fits in with what you're doing. So I think, um, Adiva specifically, I think you're, you're talking about hiring across borders and that access in talent from all over the world and that sort of thing. So a um, question from Jason, who says, love the idea of allowing staff um, working abroad, um, but do get worried when people talk about this as if it's simple, when in fact it's not. While many businesses are considering it and even allowing it, many governments still have extremely strict laws around it and what are the changes that you're aware of are there changes on the way yeah what do we how does that impact you what's your experience of working with people either wanting to move abroad and work from there or from even hiring across borders like we're saying um this is i can answer this both from our perspective and also from clients perspective because we've had a lot of different clients and different flexibility styles around hiring so it's uh it's a very complex question actually um, so for us, uh, for now, it doesn't matter if uh, any team member is working as an employee or an independent contractor, we are okay with that. Um, and uh, we have, being a US company, we have the flexibility to work with contractors uh, for a longer period um, as of now, I mean, uh, until now. Uh, there might be a change uh, in, the, in the future, but uh, we learn to adapt uh, to changes real quickly. So I think, um, we will be able to to adapt the processes around that if uh, if it's necessary. Um, so we are hiring people as independent contractors, and uh, they're working again on salary basis. So uh, we have all of the same perks and same uh, benefits for everyone. Uh, they get paid time off 
everything works as if they were uh, working as full time as uh, permanent employees. Uh, it's just the, the way of uh, engaging them, and uh, as long as it works for the people themselves, then it's fine. Uh, there are countries which are restricting this and um, they are uh, requiring companies to employ anyone who works uh, with them for a longer period of time. And for this, uh, we had uh, clients who are interested only in hiring uh, permanently, not working with independent contractors when it comes to longer uh, extended periods. Uh, so for this, uh, we've been collaborating with employer of records, agencies who are um, located in, in the particular uh, location, the particular country, they know the local laws, they know everything. Uh, they can work with you for uh, a certain fee, I mean, a certain percentage usually from the, uh, the salary uh, to, to handle everything for you locally. So in uh, that manner, you will again hire the person in a foreign country, but you will be fully compliant uh, with the local laws uh, you will have. Um, they will have an employee status, uh, they will have all of the benefits uh, for the local uh, regulation. Um, so that's, th those are the, the two directions. Uh, a lot of the startup companies are flexible, they are hiring independent contractors and they, uh, that's, that's the way most of the companies are working when it comes to um, hiring remotely. So I would encourage you to, to try it. It's not, um, it's not that troublesome uh, when it comes to, to the compliance. Uh, if you want to give them the full employee benefit, you have the second option, which is usually um, mostly utilized by enterprises. Uh, but I'm anticipating now that the world is going remote that um, a lot of uh, countries will adapt their regulations and people will need to uh, work as employees uh, instead of contractors because of you know tax reasons mostly. Okay. So I guess the overarching recommendation really is to that it's easier to work with somebody locally, is it, to 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 navigate a lot of the the nuances of one particular country or another, find a specialist in that country. Is that what you? Is that what you no, mean? I wouldn't say that. So uh, we are working with uh, remote employees from anywhere okay. in the world. So we are hiring anywhere. Direct to you. Okay. Yes, and they're working as independent contractors. Uh, that means that they don't have permanent employee status in their country, but they're okay with that uh, because uh, they, they, they don't care about the um, uh, local benefits. Uh, we, on, on our side, uh, we partner with companies that provide um, global health insurance, for example. So we, uh, we give that uh, to our community okay. members as a benefit, and they're utilizing um, these types of uh, companies which are providing uh, benefits like that to avoid having to have them locally. And that's the reason why it works um, for us to work with independent contractors, so not having them employed. Uh, and it's uh, completely legal, follows all of the, the regulations. Um, it, it's fine uh, to, to work that way. So I would encourage everyone who is thinking about uh, engaging a remote uh, person in their team to go this route. Um, and then moving forward, if the local regulations change uh, in the countries uh, where they are located, uh, then they can utilize an agency uh, from that local country to, to yeah, have this permanent employee status. Yeah. Okay. What about, I guess, um, there's also, I mean, I love the idea of it, actually, how common is, I don't know, but the idea of being that kind of nomad where you're getting technologists, particularly where you can just pick up the laptop and go travel and work from anywhere. Are you seeing a lot of move to that way? Does that change anything for you? Yes, there are a lot of people uh, who work with us who are digital nomads. Uh, and I really love it that um, people who started working with Adiva, they, they started changing this lifestyle. So we uh, we provide opportunities for, for talent across the world to work with uh, companies across the world. Um, and there were people from Macedonia in particular, but uh, also in other countries. These are uh, closer to my heart because I knew them personally when they made the switch. So people who were considering uh, finding a job and um, migrating to a different country, for example, in, in Europe to more developed countries. Um, so they, they thought that this lifestyle would be better for them if they moved away from Macedonia. Uh, but since they started working with us and got this remote opportunity, they completely changed uh, their attitude and started traveling. So uh, I have this colleague who wanted to move to Germany, but instead he started uh, working as a digital nomad. So he lived in Tenerife for a while and then in Bali for a while and wow. uh, traveled to all these exotic places. Uh, and it's fine. 
uh, for, for the clients, it's fine for us. We have this technology that enables secure access from wherever you are, so it, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and I'm seeing that uh, a lot of people go to that direction. I guess it leads on to questions around um, the maintaining the culture at work. In fact, there are a couple of questions on on it already into the into the chat as well, and into the into the questions. It's something we we'd raised as well. Is um, I would try. I don't know where to bite my tongue and guard my own opinions, but people probably know what they are anyway. Is that um, I think for years there's almost been a misnomer of "Hey, we're such a great culture." Look, there's the table tennis tables, and there's beer in the fridge, and whoa, what a culture! Which is all very office oriented and isn't really about the culture of who you are. <laughs> and um, and I think a lot of those companies and a lot of those people really struggle to then figure out what is our identity now in an organization where I can't see people and we can't interact and we can't have a laugh over lunch and things like that but um there's how you maintain and build and be purposeful around building a culture of an organization where they're remote but there's also then balancing that out with there are some people that want to be in an office and or their home for them is a is a shared house in a, in the center of london and really they're better off in an office and that's the only way they'll concentrate or there's kids and pets and everything else versus they're working alongside and in teams with people who are sat on a beach in Bali who knows but then how do you balance out the culture question around that and what is your organizational culture across remote and office and and everything together huge question go <laughs> I think you put it very well uh so there's this common misconception about there was actually uh before we all went remote uh what culture means and uh I think a lot of people were connecting it with uh, the perks you get in the office and how you interact with people and everything um, but I think it's it's more about uh, creating this culture of being transparent and honest and uh, a place where people can speak up and connect with each other. Because I've, I've been working with teams where uh, we haven't met at all uh, in person, but we had this energy which uh, drove every one of us forward and uh, we, we delivered so much uh, just because we, we had this connection uh, between us. Uh, and there was this culture of being able to share anything or uh, whether it's personal or uh, professional to um, maybe uh, talk with people if you can't uh, deliver something and someone has your back, uh, even though they haven't met you. So that's the type of culture that I I want um, us to build at Adiva and we're constantly uh, trying to uh, move forward to, I mean, to, to improve uh, at, at any point. Uh, and these are the things that uh, when I say remote culture uh, come to mind. So uh, don't never judge uh, people's performance based on how much time they spend uh, in front of the computer or whether they are available at uh, any time when they get your question on, on Slack because that only leads to burnout. Uh, just uh, make sure you focus on the results, uh, on what people are uh, delivering, uh, not how or what they did to, to deliver it. Um, make sure you're transparent. Uh, we are uh, holding these all hands meetings with both with the community and our core team at Adiva to make sure we uh, share uh, everything that we focus on in the given uh, period. Uh, so that we know people are on the same page and uh, we can get their questions, we can get their concerns, they have uh, this place to voice anything um, they need really. One-on-one uh, -on -one meetings as well uh, with uh, department leads and uh, team members. Um, all this, uh, we, we talked about uh, async work at the beginning and how uh, going full documentation style uh, would hurt uh, the, the culture in the company and that's completely true if you don't have this personal connection uh, with the team. So uh, that's why I mentioned that uh, async collaboration comes in addition to uh, building this culture around transparency and communication with, with the team and being able to uh, discuss whenever you have a problem or uh, if you need help with something or to give feedback. So uh, to me, that that's uh, the most important part of uh, a company culture, that communication and transparency between the team. And from there, you know, you just uh, everything comes together real nicely. I think a lot of what you've described and you know in our in our ideal culture that we're that we try and build in our organizations, a lot of it is so rooted in the in the trust between between peers and the team that you're actually working in and between 
the the leaders of the organization and across the organization but but that trust and that personal connection is so important i think that's where probably some people struggle when they see when when they're not it just happen to see people across the room or if they they don't know where people yeah. are that it's how you build that trust so it's less probably about remote but it's more about building trust in an organization if i get on my soapbox for one of my moments is that um that i think in person if you happen to be in the same room even if you're not working directly with that person and, and working together on something is almost a false sense of relationship and trust and that it's it you might think that you know that person really well just because you happen to have seen their face from across the room for, yeah. for six hours a day or something whereas it's not real it's not real trust it's not real um connection and, and actually caring about those people and the, what they're doing so it takes more effort remote but it's probably deeper when you do get to it Exactly. Yeah. You also mentioned earlier uh, about people choosing to work from the office or having to work from the office. I wanted to um, touch a bit about uh, on that. So the, the thing is that not everyone, uh, we, talk, we talked about it earlier, not everyone is productive uh, working remotely, working from home, actually. Um, but when we talk about remote work, uh, I, I never want to just uh, restrict it for, to work from home. So that's why I'm always saying, working remotely instead of working from home. Uh, there are so many co-working spaces. There are so many uh, other, even cafes where people uh, tend to go and work together. And uh, even for people, for companies that don't have an office and they uh, still want to encourage um, the extroverts or uh, people who want to, to have more social connection, um, they can invest in this co-working spaces, give people a uh, pass to a space like this where they can uh, still socialize, but also, um, you know, be able to, to contribute to their company. So it's not like uh, when you build this culture and uh, you are remote, but you also want to uh, provide an office, but it doesn't make sense because uh, you get just a handful of people in the office and uh, your costs are too high. Um, there, there are uh, things that you can do and um, tools that you can utilize and um, the, the whole ecosystem is growing in a direction which enables us to collaborate better remotely. So I think these are the things that companies could also consider if you if having an office is too expensive for you, but you still want to provide that, try to, to be creative with other solutions that are available. Excellent. That's a good idea. And there are a couple of conversations going on in the chat and there's a question that's really relevant as well it said um i think it's damien that's asked it in the in the article question section so especially in larger companies it's really easy for quieter people to be forgotten are there any techniques for bringing quieter colleagues into the team and out of their shell i guess that's one aspect the other aspect is to be more accommodating of quieter members and accept that some people are quiet it's not just a you know extroverts love us to go and put ourselves out there but how about the extroverts quieting down a little bit as well i'm just saying you know that's another possibility um but where i think it's linked to the conversation that's going on in the chat i can see is um dominic has posted something around um that and i think I, i've seen those kinds of studies as well and it's about that kind of proximity and getting noticed as a as a vehicle to to promotion shall we say so in the study he's posted over in the chat says that you're um working from home decreased promotion probability by 12 percent in one study that they saw or that working from home can mean 38 percent less likely to receive a bonus and i've seen it in years gone by as well where it's about visibility and proximity and being in the office is what gets you noticed and what gets what gets you recognized and everything else so how do we balance that what kind of tips and tricks and and especially as leaders in an organization so the people that obviously in CTO craft as an organ as a as a community and the people that are on the call today have very much a leadership bias how can you work against that and try and level the playing field for everybody I think we should all be very conscious about this and this is a very interesting discussion because I've never seen a uh, similar stat so this is new to mm -hmm. me as well um, I think even if you are in the office, uh, how, how do you encourage quieter members to, uh, to to get involved, right? You need to be mindful about it. You need to um, have empathy and think that not everyone thinks like you or not everyone um, reacts in the same way as uh, the, the most vocal people do. Uh, one thing that, and this has to come uh, from management, uh, 
so if, if the company management is not uh, up to the challenge and they don't want to uh, spend time on this, then I guess uh, it's still for failure. Um, one thing that has worked very well uh, with the late, uh, most recent meeting that I had, uh, because a lot of uh, new people uh, in the company and I wanted them to uh, get more involved. Uh, so, but you need to to set up the environment for them to be comfortable uh, doing that. Uh, so, uh, what we did is we sent out um, the agenda up front and um, any expectations uh, for discussion. Uh, so that they can think about it, um, they can maybe come up with some discussion points if uh, it, it's interesting for them. Uh, because I've noticed that uh, this comes from me personally, I'm not, um, when I'm uh, in a crowd like that, I tend to be uh, quieter myself. And uh, when I have more time to prepare and think about, you know, what uh, I want to say or what opinion I have on a specific topic that needs to be discussed, uh, then I'm more able to, um, you know, speak up and uh, get involved in the discussion. And this is also um, in person, and it, it even might be uh, harder in person because in, uh, when you are in the same room with people and you need to stand up and talk uh, in front of them, but you are quieter, uh, you need uh, someone to to help you through, through this whole, whole process. So uh, most of the uh, actions that we can take are similar, regardless if it's an office environment or remote. Uh, the main thing is to be mindful that, that there are people who are, um, and people are dif different. So to be more inclusive, to be to encourage diversity, and to make sure that uh, everyone uh, is able to to speak up and uh, be heard. When it comes to working remotely specifically or having people some people in the office and some remote i've noticed this um, when we started organizing these meetings which were hybrid meetings so some people were in person and other people were joining in from different countries so um, making sure that you're remote first uh, is very important here uh, when in the first meetings we had people who were writing uh, on a whiteboard uh, and this wasn't visible for the people who joined uh, online so you just notice that they're not able to um, jump in the discussion as easily and they're not able to raise their concerns because it's it's very localized uh, so we had to be more conscious about uh, anything that like this that uh, popped up in that meeting and um, address it on the next one so now we go with screen shares regardless if um, most of the people are together. We still uh, share the screen. We still we draw on screen instead of the whiteboard, um, or we stream the whiteboard drawing. If someone needs to draw on the whiteboard. But the things that you know make the other people people who are uh, joining both uh, included and able to uh, to share their opinion. Um, and another thing, when there is a heated discussion. Uh, it's also very hard for people who are remote to jump in. Uh, so uh, you need someone uh, to. Um, to be kind of like a moderator here and make sure that, uh, you know, okay, calm down, let's hear the opinion of Emma, who is joining remotely. Oh, we just lost your screen, certainly. I think maybe your connection is dropping out a little bit, but that's okay. We'll keep going. I can hear you. I think everyone else can hear you at least, and you'll join us again in a minute. Um, it, it looks well on my side. Um, Maybe it's just me. Maybe, Maybe it's me that's dropping out. It's be fine. Okay. Um. Another question says from the audience, and by all means, do keep asking your questions. Everybody, pop them into the chat and into the um ask a question at the bottom. We have around probably what 15, 20 minutes left. So, um, what have you found has worked well for building social connections remotely between teams? That's Joel that's asked that question, and it just have both as well for it. So um, I think I think I spotted someone else. I think it was Ashley posted in the chat around, you know, back in the day when we were all remote and everyone was struggling with it. Um, the weekly quiz nights on Zoom and all that stuff was happening really regularly. And I, I was doing like three different ones a week at one point as well. So there was loads of them. Um, but a lot of that's dropped off now and we all got sick of it as well. Let's be honest, you know, the same questions cropping up all the time in those quizzes. Um, but it is the thing, especially if um, you're so spread out, what can you, yeah, what kind of recommendations and tips can you can you give to to build those social connections because it is that that non-working time that's really important to to building the personal connections and relationships that enables the trust and everything else that comes with it so yeah how do people do that in a remote world 
Uh, for us, it's very important to, to create a sense of community uh, with uh, all of the members of Adiva. So regardless of what client you work with, uh, we want them to be to feel like they belong, to have people they can connect to and discuss. Um, so we are working now on uh, creating a, a structure for them uh, to, to be able to discuss online, like uh, different topics to connect with people who are who have the same skill set to discuss about professional growth and uh, maybe uh, do some peer programming sessions or whatever is um, works uh, for them in, in that given scenario. On the other side, we have people who like to travel and then uh, they connect with people, local people from the country they're visiting. Um, we had one case where uh, two people who met online, they haven't met in person at all. They've been working together for a year. Uh, and now um, one person is uh, traveling from Russia to Serbia and uh, the uh, person who lives in Serbia gives him the key of his apartment because he won't be uh, there for the weekend. So we, people are able to build this connection even though they, are, they haven't met uh, each other at all um, in person. Uh, because of this trust and this collaboration that's been going on. Um, I think it helps a lot to have uh, video on every uh, meeting uh, with anyone uh, in the company uh, to uh, talk a bit about uh, personal stuff at the beginning of each meeting, uh, just to have this uh, connection to the other person, uh, to have this one-on-one -on -one meetings again uh, to discuss more about uh, how how, how you're feeling, how are you uh, growing at work and everything that, that matters because uh, this helps us to create this uh, connection between uh, each other and increase the trust. And I think with that, um, everything that we discuss around the culture will um, will continue to, to, you know, the, the dots will uh, connect. Um, I think those things about the quizzes and uh, movie nights and everything, they were interesting in the beginning, but once uh, you know, they become, became regular, uh, it's, it's more of a, a chore for people to join instead of an enjoyment. Everyone loves forced fun, right? That's it. <laughs> yes. It's on a call and chat. So, yeah. Um, there's an interesting comment actually over in the chat, and I don't think we've covered it entirely. So we did talk about the kind of, you know, how you unlock some of the, the benefits and, and, and the advantages of working remote and getting people to work from everywhere. And um, But what we did do is focus a lot, I guess, on, it's very easy to focus on the benefit to the individual, as in, you know, there's, it allows for, for family life more and less traveling and the headspace for introverts and, and the flexibility for the extroverts and everything that goes with that on an individual level. But somebody has posted as well about um, what kind of benefits there are to working remotely, not just for the individual, but as the group itself. Are there collective benefits as well then for the, for the team, for the company? What kind of benefits could you, could you show for people? See over here the thing we talked about, like uh, switching the mindset from uh, time to results uh, is the key. Uh, because if you're unable to do that, then uh, there will probably be no benefit to, to working remotely. Uh, mm -hmm. With companies, some of our clients, they insist on having time trackers uh, for their team members, and we're strongly against that. Because, uh, you know, just tracking clicks and uh, taking screenshots of whatever that person opened uh, on their computer, it's not uh, productive for anyone. Uh, it will just uh, you know, be a barrier for creating this trust and uh, no one wants to contribute in an environment like that. Uh, so when you create uh, an environment where people trust each other, they, they are in line with the company vision and um, what we want to achieve as a group, I think that people want to contribute. Um, and for me, I'm uh, now I, I've read a lot about this uh, four-day work week model, which is I think is popular in Sweden, um, and I'm finding it very interesting to to have this flexible schedule where you can arrange your time as needed. Some days I only have two hours of work, and I don't need to stay in front of the computer because just because I need to to fill a quote. Um, so I can work for two hours today and contribute a bit more on another day when I'm needed. And this is the sense of um, contribution I have for the organization because uh, the organization gave a lot to me and I want to give back and I want to show results based on which I will be, uh, my performance will be reviewed uh, later on. So it's kind of like a, a magic circle um, because whatever we give uh, to our employees, if we give it with uh, you know, genuinely, then uh, the, the company will just uh, reap the benefits from it. I think there is something as well, like you said, they, 
it's easy to think of those advantages for the individual, but actually an environment that's that's inclusive and is equitable for everybody and is able to be more diverse, that is a benefit to the team. Teams are better when when people are able to work at the best the way that they can rather than so I think the it does go hand in hand individually and for the team as well and for the organization. Right. Um, this is a longer question and by all means, everybody keep asking and asking questions away. Um, so I'm going to take a minute to read it. And I think it's particularly relevant because of this, um, the leadership angle into it and how as a leader you enable some of that. So Ray has asked, in a recent podcast, it's speculated that leaders feel powerless in a remote world. And when fearful leaders tend to talk about workplace culture, in quotes, um, but what they actually mean is workplace control, like you say, monitoring clicks or time that they spend away, or how do you check up on people? What are your thoughts on maintaining accountability as a leader in a remote team and working on that psychological safety at all levels so that leads really nice I think on from that but especially as your responsibility as a leader then in those teams and what you can do right yeah I think it's it's extremely important and the first step is uh, for us to acknowledge the type of leaders uh, that we are and make sure that uh, we can do the switch that it takes uh, to thrive in this remote world so if you uh, want to have full control then you, you won't be able to work uh, in a remote environment. You won't be able to deliver based on your own, um, on the scale that you've set for yourself because uh, you, you can't have that uh, control when working remotely. So I think that mindset switch is uh, the first most important thing that we need to do if, uh, if we are going to be successful in a remote environment because uh, as a leader, you need to you need to focus on the results and not um, not the time, as we as we said. So not how much time people spend in front of the computer or whether they showed up or didn't show up for work. It's they they can some people uh, like to work in the evenings. Um, and if we're going a step further with this remote working, I think that's the way uh, that companies should. Um, uh, sh should utilize it to give full flexibility to people because uh, if you are your most productive self in the evenings, uh, then you can you can do the best uh, work at that period. And then if we have this synchronous communication in place where nobody depends on you and uh, everyone can work seamlessly, then that's that's the bottom line is. Um, it's best for for the company and uh, as a leader you're driving the company forward so uh, thinking about you know changing the the way you think uh, about control and uh, the way you think about results and focusing on uh, what people deliver instead of how they deliver it or what they do or what time they work i think that's the most important part um, and from there uh, just um, i guess focusing on this uh, trust building moment with people is uh, key to to being successful as a leader because everything will will fall back to place from there so what do you think the future holds then i mean i can see even when you look on social media or linkedin anything you there's much more i guess polarizing views and not just on about remote work but everything right the world is tending to go that way so there's a bunch of people that are like everybody back to the office there's a bunch of people that are like everybody remote and come and anywhere and anything and any time and there's a bunch of people trying to walk the line in between but where do you think the direction of travel really is then for the future so for me i think i would hope uh, that we would be uh, more flexible moving forward and that companies uh, would understand the benefits that they have as businesses uh, from remote working so um, how how much easier it is to scale uh, how much easier it is to grow the team remotely um, how much easier it is to deliver when there are some people working in India and other people are working in uh, the US and uh, third group in the Europe so you, you're, you're covering all the time zones and uh, you can have 24 7 productivity if you want to um, there, there are a lot of benefits on business level from uh, working remotely and especially from working globally, so with, with global talent. Uh, so I really hope that um, we can, we will go in that direction where, where companies learn to, to value that and to focus on their results. Um, and uh, on the other side, we have uh, flexible working and asynchronous working, which are uh, things that I, I believe that um, we will need to adapt to in the future because uh, if we are this won't change, so we won't go back to office environment uh, for sure, as it was. I mean, uh, 
before the pandemic. Uh, so I think that being more flexible uh, with uh, working hours, with uh, people's lives, uh, because um, there are things that people like to balance uh, with work, of course. Um, so the flexibility uh, of uh, time and space and um, asynchronous work when it comes to having this processing in place where people can communicate with each other, can uh, be can support each other's work, uh, but still uh, not have to be online at the same time. I think these are the things that uh, will shape the way we work in the future. How likely do you think it is that, um, like I know, almost like a power shift or a coalescing around one camp or another, you know, I've seen plenty of posts and companies that talk about, you know, if you force people back to the office and everyone's going to go back full time, then the people that want to work remote will just up and leave and go to a company that is more flexible. And I guess this and the same will happen vice versa. So we're going to I guess we we risk a future. Or we, we have a possibility of a future where the people that want to work in the office all the time will end up at companies that want you in the office all the time. And the people that want to be remote will end up at companies that are open to remote all the time. Do you think that's um yeah do you think that's direction of travel is there some risk around that that we end up even more polarized with like those those views of of everyone sort of coalescing around one camp or another is is that power shifting a bit do you think i think that's a good point because if you're forcing people who want to go to the office uh, to work remotely then yes uh even if they don't leave uh, they won't be productive and you won't have the benefits that, that we discussed uh, but i think the whole uh, change in the work environments and how people uh, see work and the flexibility is something that everyone wants regardless if uh, they're working in the office or they work from home or if they prefer social connections or not uh, being flexible around i don't know child care times and being able uh, to be there for your for your family when you're needed or to do whatever else you want to do with your time apart from work. Uh, so having this uh, is very important for, for everyone, regardless if uh, they are in the office or not. Um, so the flexibility of work uh, is something that uh, I think we'll all need to reconsider and um, put it in place uh, because uh, on the long run, it will be beneficial for the business. In terms of working from an office or uh, from home or from anywhere else, I think uh, it's also linked to the flexibility and uh, being able to give people the option uh, is the best uh, is, is the best we can offer really. Uh, whether that's option that's an option um, that they can use to go to your office or they can uh, use a different place to work from, which is not home. I think uh, it's something that uh, that that can contribute to the to the overall satisfaction of people in the team and the productivity. So for us, even though we are remote, uh, we are now investing into creating these community spaces in different locations. Wherever we have more people uh, that work from, uh, we we want to open this hub, uh, we call it the hub, uh, where people can you know connect and uh, work together. They can organize events. They can just, I don't know, maybe cook together and have fun. So I think it's very important to have this social connection and to enable it for people. Um, of course, investing in something like that is uh, huge and not, uh, it, it doesn't fit the budget of most of the companies, uh, but uh, allowing, I don't know, four people in the same town to work together from some apartment or, or from some co-working space is something that you can give to them if you're not able to give them an office. Uh, so I agree with you. Uh, it's not, you know, going one way or another. We need to be flexible in all um, manners if we want to to take the most of uh, of the future of work. I'd be interested to see, um, and I guess future years and studies will show it, but I mean, just the sense of it, your gut feel says that this has got to do so much for DE and I, for diversity statistics and, and the profiles across organizations. When you take into account just gender diversity or or people who are parenting or caring for other relatives or or neurodiversity or just eth ethnic backgrounds and social economic factors all of that just is a as a level playing field when you can work how and where and when 
you want to. So we must be opening up so many more opportunities to improve our, our diversity profiles across organizations. And I haven't seen any studies on it yet, but I'm assuming there will be and be looking forward to it. We then we just all we've got to do is tackle getting people into tech in the first place, which is a whole different ball game. But um but yeah, what are you seeing any trends? What's your thoughts on that too? Uh, in, in terms of the flexibility and the diversity? Yeah, I guess the future and what it means for DE and I as we go more remote. Um, I guess so. So for us, uh, we started employing people in Egypt uh, recently. Uh, we were so uh, we are fully remote uh, when it comes to our community. Uh, but for some reason, uh, all of our core members were based in Macedonia. I guess that was because of those in-person uh, events that we wanted to uh, to use to connect and uh, to make people more accountable. Um, so we recently decided to change that because you know this is what we stand for, and we want it to be the same for our internal team as well. Um, and we started some of our uh, people from Macedonia. Uh, moved to different countries. Uh, we started employing uh, mostly from Egypt uh, recently because, uh, I don't know, not, not specifically focused, but uh, circumstances just uh, made us go in that direction. And I'm seeing now that uh, we did become uh, much more inclusive just because uh, we, we did that simple uh, switch of, you know, hiring from other countries and um, allowing people to move wherever they want in the world it just um, made us adapt uh, all of the processes that we have internally in the company um, and uh, also be more mindful about whatever uh, cultures and habits other people have so i'm still learning about uh, you know the cultures uh, people have in egypt and uh, they are working different uh, weekdays for example so uh, we are now trying to find a way to adapt to that and not uh, make them work on a weekend which is uh, a weekend for them so these are uh, there are a lot of things that you learn uh, through the process and if you want to be more inclusive if, if you want to adapt your culture to that um, then it, it really uh, makes a difference and this flexible work I have seen it um, for myself personally I became a mother recent, not so recent uh, it's my kid has one year I recently got back to work and um, I realized that I want to change my working schedule and to have more time with him during the day and then uh, work more in the mornings and in the evenings uh, so having an environment that allows me to do that makes me a lot more productive uh, than I would be if I had to work for, for the full day and just uh, neglect all of my other um, things that were important uh, to me personally. So that's, I think, the, the main thing to, to make sure you allow people to focus on what matters to them. We are just about out of time. We just have a couple of minutes left just to wrap things up. Is there any final thoughts or recommendations or, or yeah, how would you close it then, Katarina? What's your, what's your wrap up for people? I would say that there are a lot of challenges, uh, but uh, we have this, this value that we promote that we find uh, opportunity in every challenge. So there is an opportunity in every challenge. And I would just like to encourage people to, to try working with uh, remote people if they haven't yet. Uh, and everything uh, will will sort itself out uh, on the long run. So just uh, make sure that you are open to, to any problem that you face and that uh, you look for solutions proactively. Everything will, will fall into place. Excellent. Thank you. Um, over in the chat, I have posted um, contact details for both myself and Katerina, although I've just noticed my Twitter is up there and I dumped Twitter ages ago and moved to Mastodon. So I should probably update that and move that over there. And I'll see you on those servers if you're there too. Um, and I've also posted a link to the next Bytes event happening next week. So next week, we're joined by Alexia Peterson, who's the VP EMA at um, O'Reilly. And she is discussing why flexible learning is key to helping companies close the digital skills gap by investing in technical learning and rethinking how they engage remote workers. Organizations can better build talent from within, all while future-proofing their businesses. So very nice lead on from today's conversation. And with that, I will wrap up. Thank you very much, Katerina. Nice to see you. Thank you, Emma. Oh, and Damien, I'll see you on Mastodon. That's cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bye, everybody.